Is there something that individual bishops can do within their own jurisdictions, their own dioceses, to address these scandals, apart from acts of penance and openness? Like, is there a particular step if you were, you know, running for your seminaries because you brought up seminaries? Um, is, there, is there something that bishops should be doing on their own right now that they aren't? They can release well, their records. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's the low-hanging fruit, it seems. You know, when after the Monday morning bombshell that, you know, the bishops couldn't vote on this, most of us in the press corps went outside to listen to the protest. And sort of what bishop accountability groups and survivor, survivor groups wanted was a release of names of credibly accused priests. Uh, and I think uh, just offering that would be a very tangible step forward. Uh, and many said, if, if they do this between now and February, we will see some sort of forward motion that we're sort of maybe not okay with, but it's a, you know, a step in the right direction. And I would, I would be very careful to make those lists very accurate, um, right down to, in a lot of cases, these credibly accused priests, their uh, accusations ended in closed settlements. Mm. Um, and these settlements basically failed to resolve what was a disagreement uh, between oftentimes the archdiocese and the victims about what exactly the archdiocese had done. Um, so some ambiguity exists there, and the result of that is going to be if you put these lists out with details that are disputed by the victims, it's only going to make things worse. Uh, if the lists themselves appear to be inconsistent uh, with what victims and parishioners know, um, and you know, obviously in Buffalo that created a huge disaster when there was an incomplete list released, um, and the Archdiocese of Washington has released its own list um, that victims have questions about. Um, and so what? release records very accurately would be my advice. Just to sign it, one bishop said to me during Baltimore, you know, I don't want to, re you know, I'm happy to release the names of all my accused priests, but I think we should have a directory of priests in good standing because I'm tired of my priests having to worry about if people are wondering about them. Yeah, yeah you know, I, I, I'd never heard that floated, but it was just something new that sort of emerged. Yeah, and I think that's fair as well because mm -hmm. um, priests have to live with a stigma right. at this point. Right. People say disgusting things to them on the street. I have a friend who's a priest who's a high school teacher, and the kids always say horrible things to their teachers. But now, I mean, you can imagine the abuse. Um, and it's, it's awful. Credibility is a, ter is a term of art in the church. It doesn't mean, w when we hear the word credibility, most of us think, oh, yeah, that means it probably happened. Uh, you release a list of credibly accused priests, and I think the, the concern is most people think, oh, yeah, those guys are probably guilty. In, in the church, when we talk about credibility, Bishops use it in various ways, but they're connecting it to canonical ideas that are more akin to sort of, could it have happened, was the guy in the country at the time when he was said to have, be, to have been in the country? Is it, is it not manifestly false or frivolous? Um, does it have some semblance of, of connection to reality? And, um, and so if, we just really, if the bishops just release names of credibly accused priests and they don't explain that, mm -hmm. um, a great many priests who, are, who have not done anything are going to suffer as a consequence of that. And, if they do explain that, they're going to have to explain it extremely well and, and often. Because if you're on a list that says credibly accused of sexual abuse, it doesn't matter what's at the top of the list or the bottom of the list. And, um, and so that's hard. I think bishops are going to have to figure that out or get a better term or figure out, a better th figure out the right threshold. Where in the process do we release the name? Because the establishment of credibility is pretty early in the process. The person hasn't necessarily had the right to defend themselves yet. And I think we still believe in the rule of law and due process when people are accused of sexual misconduct. I, I hope that we do as a church. Um, and so bishops are going to have to figure out, and probably together, where's the point at which we release names. I think people want transparency in the process. They want to know this is what the, this is what the church is doing when she hears that someone has you know, been accused of misconduct. And there, there's been sort of the veneer of transparency in the process, but maybe there are reports that bishops can give that give more details about what the review boards have done. If there's this metropolitan idea for metropolitans to look into their suffragan bishops, which has a lot of merits, maybe um, metropolitans could sort of release um, information about the, the processes that they do. But the, the information has to be comprehensive enough that we're, we're not sort of indicting priests who have not yet you know, had any opportunity to defend themselves. I think we heard that a lot in Baltimore. We yeah. need uniform standards yeah. for this. Mm -hmm. so. And I, I do think due process is very important. Uh, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it can't right. be overlooked just because of the, you know, the situation is severe. It doesn't mean there aren't going to be, um, like you're saying, frivolous complaints that get thrown in sure. um, from time to time. And so, I mean, if it's a matter of releasing records, um, as for, you know, the South, um, Southern California had to do that in a few settlements. Um, and those are pretty enlightening on how the process worked as well. 
Um, and so, you know, especially if you have convicted priests, I don't see the harm of just releasing those personnel records. That'll give people a good insight into how the process works. But uh, more clarity here seems to be better than less, I think. Yeah, I mean, I can say from personal experience that we, I, a, a priest who I know very well is currently, quote unquote, credibly accused. Yeah. And has, this has been publicized in our parish and he has, you know, his faculties are suspended. Um, and, you know, I don't want to do the thing where you say you're morally certain he's innocent because we've yeah. learned that that's an unwise thing to say, but I think he's very likely innocent. And it's sort of a striking thing to watch, you know, how this, the language of credible accusation yeah. creates a presumption of guilt around something that right now is one allegation from 25 years ago that is probably, probably not going to result in his suspension. So it seems, I mean, it's, it's complicated, yeah, <laughs> right? It is. The other thing I do if I was a bishop is I'd establish a set of sort of graduated and consistent penalties and processes for priests who have moral failings with women or men or seminarians and, and so that people knew what to expect and priests did too, because that's a huge point of ambiguity now. Is that something that can be done? I mean, this is a canonical question, right? right? Can that be done by bishops? My canon law professors in the room. I think yes. You think yes. Think <laughs> you think an individual. He's bishop nodding. Yes. Can an individual say, he's bishop nodding. An individual those, bishop can say. Yeah, could establish some penalties you, and processes to say in our diocese, if you have a moral failing, uh, you know, if you if you commit an act of uh, an act of sexual misconduct with a grown up under these circumstances, these are the penalties. And if you do it twice, these are the penalties. And if, and you if do it's it in the thorn birds, right. it's like you know the yeah. The, <laughs> Right. No, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just, I think there's you have a lot to, of unclarity in the language in the yeah, reporting that's absolutely. not helpful. Where, when we say, you know, there was sexual misconduct with a priest and a grown woman, some people are going to say, okay, so knowing the Catholic Church, that was a rape, right? Right, but it's right. It's not necessarily exactly. yeah, that. Right, and so exactly, there's a lot yeah. of difficulty mm -hmm. with a really ambiguous language. Yeah, yeah. And, and distinguishing between coercive sexual activity. Right. And, uh, right. Cardinal Supich took a lot of heat for saying there's a difference between sexual activity with adults and sexual activity with children. But there is. We all know that. Um, and so the church has to figure out a way to address that in a real way, too.